Yo, we're back. 12 Rules for Life, Jordan Peterson, Chapter 2. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Why won't you just take your damn pills? Imagine that a hundred people are prescribed a drug. Consider what happens next. One third of them won't fill the prescription. Half of the remaining 67 will fill it, but won't take the medication correctly. They'll miss doses, they'll quit taking it early, they might not even take it at all. Physicians and pharmacists tend to blame such patients for their non-compliance, inaction and error. You can lead a horse to water, they reason. Psychologists tend to take a dim view of such judgments. We are trained to assume that the failure of patients to follow professional advice is the fault of the practitioner, not the patient. We believe that healthcare providers, so we believe that the healthcare provider has a responsibility to proffer advice that will be followed, offer interventions that will be respected, plan with the patient or client until the desired result is achieved, and follow up to ensure that everything is going correctly. This is just one of the many things that make psychologists so wonderful. Of course, we have the luxury of time with our clients, unlike other, more beleaguered professionals, who wonder why sick people won't take their medication. What's wrong with them? Don't they want to get better? Here's something worse. Imagine that someone receives an organ transplant. Imagine it's a kidney. A transplant typically occurs only after long periods of anxious await after a long period of anxious waiting on the part of the recipient. Only a minority of people donate organs when they die, and even fewer when they are still alive. Only a small number of donated organs are a good match for any hopeful recipient. This means that the typical kidney transplantee has been undergoing dialysis the only alternative for years. Dialysis involves passing all of the patient's blood out of his or her body through a machine and back in. It is an unlikely and miraculous treatment. So that's all good, but it's not pleasant. It must happen five to seven times a week for eight hours at a time. It should happen every time the patient sleeps. That's too much. No one wants to stay on dialysis. Now, one of the complications of transplantation is rejection. Your body does not like it when parts of someone else's body are stitched into it. Your immune system will attack and destroy such foreign elements, even when they are crucial to your survival. To stop this from happening, you must take anti-rejection drugs, which weaken immunity, increasing your susceptibility to infectious disease. Most people are happy to accept the trade-off. Recipients of transplants still suffer the effects of organ rejection, despite the existence and utility of these drugs. It's not because the drugs fail, although they sometimes do. It's more often because they are prescribed the drugs and do not take them. This beggars belief. It is seriously not good to have your kidneys fail. Dialysis is no picnic. Transplantation surgery occurs after long waiting at high risk and great expense. To lose all of that because you don't take your medication, how could people do that to themselves? How could this possibly be? It's complicated to be fair. Many people who, re who receive a transplanted organ are isolated or beset by multiple physical health problems, to say nothing of problems associated with unemployment or family crisis. They may be cognitively impaired or depressed, they may not entirely trust their doctor or understand the necessity of the medication. Maybe they can barely afford the drugs and ration them desperately and unproductively. But, and this is the amazing thing, imagine that it isn't you who feels sick, it's your dog. So you take him to the vet. The vet gives you a prescription. What happens then? You have just as many reasons to distrust a vet as a doctor. Furthermore, if you cared so little for your pet that you weren't concerned with what improper substandard or error-ridden pre prescription he might be given, you wouldn't have taken him to the vet in the first place. 
Thus, you care. Your actions prove it. In fact, on average, you care more. People are better at filling and proper, properly administering prescription medication to their pets than to themselves. That's not good. Even from your pet's perspective, it's not good. Your pet probably loves you and, wouldn't, and would be happier if you took your medication. It is difficult to conclude anything from this set of facts except that people appear to love their dogs, cats, ferrets and birds and maybe even their lizards more than themselves. How horrible is that? How much shame must exist for something like that to be true? What could it be about people that makes them prefer their pets to themselves? It was an ancient story in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Old Testament, that helped me find an answer to that perplexing question. The older story and the nature of the world. Two stories of creation from two different Middle Eastern sources appear to be woven together in the Genesis account. In the chronologically first but historically more recent account, known as the Priestly, God created the cosmos using his divine word, speaking light, water and land into existence, following that with the plants and the heavenly bodies. He then created birds and animals and fish, again employing speech, and ended with man, male and female, but somehow formed in his image. This all happens in Genesis 1. In the second, older, Jauhist version, we find another origin account, involving Adam and Eve, where the details of creation differ somewhat, as well as the stories of Cain and Abel, Noah and the Tower of Babel. That is Genesis 2-11. to To understand Genesis 1, the priestly story, with its ins insistence on speech and the fundamental creative force, it is first necessary to review a few fundamental ancient assumptions. These are markedly different in type and intent from the assumptions of science, which are historically speaking quite novel. So I'm just going to mute that so that you don't hear my email notifications. Scientific truths were made explicit a mere 500 years ago with the work of Francis Barron, René Descartes, and Isaac Newton. In whatever manner our forebearers viewed the world prior to that, it was not through a scientific lens any more than they could view the moon and the stars through the glass lens of the equally recent telescope. But we are so scientific now, and so determinedly materialistic, it is very difficult for us to even understand that the other ways of seeing things can and do exist. But those who existed during the distant time in which the, fu the foundational epics of our culture emerged were much more concerned with the actions that dictated survival and with interpreting the world in a manner commensurate with that goal than with anything approximating what we now understand as objective truth. Before dawn, the scientific worldview reality was construed differently. Being was understood as a place of action, not a place of things. It was understood as something more akin to story or drama. That story or drama was lived, subjective experience, as it manifested itself moment to moment in the consciousness of every living person. It was something similar to the stories we tell each other about our, li our lives and their personal significance, something similar to the happenings that novelists describe when they capture existence in the pages of their books. Subjective experience, that includes familiar objects such as trees and clouds, primarily objective in their existence, but also and more importantly, such things as emotions and dreams as well as hunger, thirst and pain. It is such things experienced personally that are the most fundamental elements of human life, from the archaic, dramatic perspective, and they are not easily reducible to the detached and objective, even by modern, reductionist, materialistic mind. Take pain for example. Subjective pain. That's something so real, no argument can stand against it. Everyone acts as if their pain is real. Ultimately, finally real. Pain matters. 
more than matter matters. It is for this reason, I believe, that so many of the world's traditions regard the suffering attendant upon existence as the irreducible truth of being. In any case, that which we subjectively experience can be likened much more to a novel or to a movie than to a scientific description of physical reality. It is the drama of lived experience, the unique, tragic, personal death of your father compared to the objective death listed in the hospital records, the pain of your first love, the despair of dashed hopes, the joy attended, sorry, the joy attendant upon a child's success. Checking the time. Every time I check for the time, I will admit I look for the, I have to see them down the bottom and it doesn't move for a clear second. And I'm always cautious that I haven't hit the record button. <laughs> the domain, not of matter, but of what matters. The scientific world of matter can be reduced in some sense to its fundamental constituent elements, molecules, atoms, even quarks. However, the world of experience has primal constituents as well. These are the necessary elements whose interactions define drama and fiction. One of these is chaos, another is order. The third, as there are three, is the process that mediates between the two, which appears identical to what modern people call consciousness. It is our eternal subjugation to the first two that makes us doubt the validity of existence, that makes us throw up our hands in despair and fail to care for ourselves properly. It is proper understanding of the third that allows us the only real way out. Chaos is the domain of ignorance itself. It's unexplored territory. Chaos is what extends eternally and without limits, beyond the boundaries of all states, all ideas and all disciplines. It is the foreigner, the stranger, the member of another gang, the rustle in the bushes in the night time, the monster under the bed, the hidden anger of your mother, and the sickness of your child. Chaos is the despair and horror you feel when you have been profoundly betrayed. It's the place you end up when all things fall apart, when your dreams die, when your career collapses or your marriage ends. It's the underworld of fairy tale and myth, where the dragon and the gold it guards eternally coexist. Chaos is where we are when we don't know where we are and what we are doing when we don't know what we are doing. It is, in short, all those things and situations we neither know nor understand. Chaos also, chaos is also formless potential from which the God of Genesis 1 called forth, using, called forth order using language at the beginning of time. It's the same potential from which we, made in that image, call forth the novel and ever-changing moments of our lives. And chaos is freedom, dreadful freedom too. Order, by contrast, is explored territory. That's the hundreds of millions of years old hierarchy of place, position and authority. That's the structure of society. It's the structure provided by biology too. Particularly insofar as you are adopted, adapted, sorry, as you are, to the structure of society. Order is tribe, religion, hearth, home and country. It's the warm, secure living room from which the fireplace glows and the children play. It's the flag of the nation. It's the value of the currency. Order is the floor beneath your feet and your plan for the day. It's the greatness of tradition, the rows of desks in a school classroom, the trains that leave on time, the calendar and the clock. Order is the public facade we're called upon to wear, the politeness of a gathering of civilized strangers and the thin ice on which we all skate. Order is the place where the behavior of the world matches our expectations and our desires. The place where all things turn out the way we want them to. But order is sometimes tyranny and stultification as well. When the demand for certainty and uniformity and purity becomes too one-sided. Where everything is certain, we're in order. Where Sorry, where there were, where the when things are going to according to, we are the, we are there when things are going according to plan and nothing is new and disturbing. 
In the domain of order, things behave as God intended. We like to be there. Familiar environments are congenial. In order. We're able to think about things in the long term. There things work and we are stable, calm and competent. We seldom leave places we understand, geographical or conceptual. For that reason, and we certainly do not like it when we are compelled to or when it happens accidentally. You're in order when you have a loyal friend, a trustworthy ally. When the same person betrays you, sells you out, you move from the daytime world of clarity and light to the dark underworld of chaos, confusion and despair. That's the same move you make and the same place you visit when the company you work starts to fail and your job is placed in doubt. When your tax return has been filled, that's order. When you're audited, that's chaos. Most people would rather be mugged than audited. Before the Twin Towers fell, that was order. Chaos manifested itself afterwards. Everyone felt it. The very air became uncertain. What exactly, what exactly was it that fell? Wrong question. What exactly remained standing? That was the issue at hand. When the ice you're skating on is solid, that's order. When the bottom drops out and things fall apart and you plunge through the ice, that's chaos. Order is the shire of Tolkien's hobbits. Peaceful, productive and safely inhabitable, even by the naive. Chaos is the underground kingdom of the dwarves, usurped by Smog, the treasure hoarding serpent. Chaos is the deep ocean bottom to which Pinocchio voyaged to rescue his father from Monstro, whale and fire-breathing dra dragon. That journey into darkness and rescue is the most difficult thing a puppet must do if he wants to be real, if he wants to extract himself from the temptations of deceit and acting and victimization victimization and impulse pleasure and totalitarian subjugation if he wants to take his place as a genuine being in the world. Order is the stability of your marriage. It's buttressed by the traditions of the past and by your expectations, grounded often invisibly in those traditions. Chaos is that stability crumbling under your feet when you discover your partner's infidelity. Chaos is the experience of reeling, unbound and unsupported through space when your guiding routines and traditions collapse. Order is the place and time where the oft invisible axioms you live by organize your experience and your actions so that, we should, so that what should happen does happen. Chaos is the new place and time that emerges when tragedy strikes suddenly or malevolence reveals its paralyzing visage even in the confines of your own home. Something unexpected or undesired can always make its appearance. When a plan is being laid out, regardless of how familiar the circumstances. When that happens, the territory has shifted. Make no mistake about it. The space, the apparent space, may be the same. But we live in time as well as space. The consequence, even the oldest and most familiar inconsequence, even the oldest and most familiar places retain an iridescible capacity to surprise you. You may be cruising happily down the road in the automobile you have known and loved for years, but time passing, the brakes could fail. You might be walking down the road in the body you have always relied on. If your heart malfunctions, even momentarily, everything changes. Friendly old dogs can still bite, Old and trusted friends can still deceive. New ideas can destroy old and comfortable certainties. Such things matter. They're real. Our brain responds instantly, even when, sorry, our brain responds instantly when chaos appears. With simple, hyper-fast circuits maintained from the ancient days, when our ancients, when our ancestors dwelled in trees, and snakes struck in a flash. After that night instantaneous deeply reflexive body response comes the latter after that night instantaneous deeply reflective bodily response comes the later evolving more complex but slower responses of emotions and after that comes thinking of the higher order 
which can extend over seconds, minutes, or years. All that response is instinctive, in some sense. But the faster the response, the more instinctive. But yeah, we're at 20 minutes. Alright, so I'm going to cut this part of the chapter there. Chapter 1 was fairly long, so I expect chapter 2 to be long. Oh, we've got another just under 30 pages of chapter 2. In any case, thank you all for watching. Um, I'll see you next time.